Welcome to the Wirecard Saga, a podcast with Tom Fox and Mikhail Ryder Gordon, Managing Director of Institutional Ethics and Integrity at Affiliated Monitors. Over this podcast series, we're going to take a deep dive into the Wirecard Saga to see where it may take us literally across the globe. Mikhail Ryder Gordon and myself continue our exploration of all things Wirecard with our episode. 23, the Gangster's Paradise Edition. We take a deep dive into potential Bothan criminal conduct, the role of Putin and Russia, who's meeting with the Department of Justice, Rostec, Skytech, and we all love tech. All on the Wirecard Saga. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Box. Welcome back to another episode of the Wirecard Saga where I'm joined by my colleague, Mikhail Ryder-Gordon, Managing Director at Affiliated Monitors. Mikhail, what do we have today? As always, thanks, Tom. Here we are on Radio Free Wirecard, episode 23. Those of you who pinged me over the last uh, few days regarding some stories you saw on the FT, not particularly new information. Uh, You longtime listeners, no doubt, sat smugly back and thought, no, thanks to lies, spies, and corporate crimes, the Wirecard Saga podcast, we all knew about this months ago. October 2020, wasn't it? When I discussed in depth Henry O'Sullivan and Jan Marsalek's meeting with the Hermes and Git guys in Vienna for the MF deal. Yeah, in fact, hmm, Mikhail told us the latest on the Hermes court case in England back in mid-March, the whole O'Sullivan, Frau Mueller identity. That was back on episode 22nd. Let's face it, by now, you've cottoned on that many frauds and scandals and other criminal activities in some way tie back to Wirecard. Because, hey, that was the business model. Bank and cleaner to the criminal and the dirty. Really? Wirecard is doby of the world's filthy shorts. So remind me to tee that up behind this particular episode on Russian organized crime and next week's episode on gaming and, well, we've got more to cover on O'Sullivan. There is so much to talk about. Listeners, I know there are so many rabbit holes of Wirecard for us to go down. But I have to remind you, I have limited time on these podcasts, and for any one theme each episode, it's it's difficult enough to fit in sufficient details for listeners in the 40-minute podcast. Okay, you're right. It's more like 50 minutes, but okay. So there is so much to cover and tell you, and I cannot get all of it into this format. Every week, I leave a substantial bit on the cutting room floor, so so to speak. But I am working on a book, so at least with that format, it'll be easier to show you listeners, turned readers, link charts and other visuals that facilitate making sense of this entirely crazy universe that is Wirecard, and its position in the greater transnational criminal universe. So in the meantime, remember, I do have a day job. Too, actually. And, and I don't get paid for doing these podcasts. So if you have documentation or other support beyond stories by news outlet, don't be shy. Go ahead and send them to me. Okay, back to it. Let's catch up on what's been going on. More hearings aplenty occurring over at the German Bundestag IC and the Austrian Parliament. But this week, for once, we're going to skip the discussions around reforming Boffin and other German regulatory bodies. Well, all right, maybe not entirely. Why? Because last week, prosecutors in the Frankfurt Public Prosecutor's Office announced they have now officially opened a criminal investigation into Boffin. The investigation includes closer examination of some of those Boffin employees trading of Wirecard stock and whether there was any possible criminal intent behind the agencies failing to regulate Wirecard. And here was Felix thinking the worst was over. Now, thus far, that is, as of April 16th, uh, 2021, the German Investigative Committee has heard testimony from some 82 people, including former members of Wirecard's AG board and supervisory board, auditors, (laughs) yeah, that was helpful testimony, wasn't it, the various and sundry clueless and incompetence of German supervisory institutions, APIS, DPR, BAFIN, ESMA, well, ESMA's not, they're the European, okay, So they're not clueless and incompetent. But they heard testimony from them. They heard testimony from the Bundesbank. 
several public servants drawn from Germany's highest federal authorities, including the BMF, BMWI, and BKMT, and a smattering of those who tried to draw regulators' attention to Wirecard over the years, such as hedge funders Matthew Earle and Fami Kadir. Later this week, headmistress herself, Angela Merkel, will be interviewed by the IC, as will Federal Minister of Justice Christine Lambrecht, Jörg Kukis, State Secretary in the Federal Ministry of Finance, and none other than Olaf Scholz, Federal Minister of Finance. But last week, there were several other folks in the IC that the IC heard reports from. There was the IC's special investigator, Martin Vombach, who looked into the completeness of EY's audits of Wirecard over the years. Short version of his lengthy conclusion? Yeah, not so much. Not so thorough. Lots of taking people's word for it, and a little short on critical thinking, analysis, documentation, and substantive inquiry. Yeah, that was EY. Is this really a finding? Hadn't we already figured this out some time ago? But the IC also received documents back from another special investigator, Wolfgang Wieland, to whom the IC had tasked with reviewing files from Germany's intelligence and law enforcement agencies that were relevant to Wirecard. Now, that report came back from Wieland, but oops, a whole lot of redaction. It was so bad that even one of the IC's leaders, Jens Zimmermann, complained about the intelligence agency's, quote, seeming unwillingness to cooperate, saying, we're being presented with blackened pages. Gotta love redaction. Wieland had to tell the IC that there wasn't specific proof of interaction between Wirecard and German intelligence services, which MP Bayaz attributed less to a lack of evidence and more so to, quote, poor communication of information from the federal government. Other members of the IC responded to Wieland saying it just wasn't realistic that Germany's top intelligence agency, the BND, had never heard of Marsalek or Wirecard. And Wieland did say, mm, yeah, Germany's federal criminal police office, their FBI, had actually used Wirecard's credit cards, but wait for this, for its fraud investigations. <laughs> oh, God, the irony is too kerslicka. Okay, so in the absence of meaningful information from Wieland, the IC summoned two former spooks, Bernd Schmidmauer and Klaus Dieter Fritscher. Yes, that Fritscher. Go back to the earlier episodes, 15 and 17, if you've forgotten Fritscher, his lobbying on behalf of Wirecard, his former role in the Chancellery, his consulting services to Austrian right-wing party FPO, on intelligence matters, no less, and, of course, his advisory work to the Austrian BVT, the very agency Marsalek was so deeply embroiled. Schmidbauer? Schmidbauer coordinated intelligence for Germany back in the 1990s under Chancellor Helmut Kohl. Now, again, listeners, you know some of this already. You can smugly say to yourself that way back in Episode 7, what was that, last September, I told you it had been identified right at the collapse of the company that Marsalek had been feeding or selling germ information to German, Austrian, and Russian intelligence. And recall, in episode 11, I also talked about Wirecard providing credit cards to police intellig and intelligence officers. And then, of course, lately, we've been following the oh-so-sordid, and frankly, just embarrassing, information about Austria's leaking sieve, the BVT, and Marsalek and Wirecard selling and trading information, like baseball cards, with current and former BVT employees. Collect the whole set. Now, Schmidtbauer, who still apparently views himself as not fully retired at age 82, go boomer, go boomer, told the IC that he and other senior intelligence officers, active and retired, not only became concerned about what they were hearing of Marsalek's intelligence contacts and his mm, rather extravagant claims, but actually attempted to work to stop Marsalek. Can we all agree he and his cronies should have tried harder, the stopping thing? He testified that out of concern, he sought to explore why Marsalek truly knew regarding national security matters and intelligence connections. He actually met with Marsalek over dinner, saying, I wanted this conversation to see how he reacted to certain things. So Schmidbauer recounted to the IC 
that Marsalek had told him that he had intensive intelligence contacts with Libya. But in Schmidbauer's view, these so-called contacts were eh, not very high-ranking. When Schmidbauer raised the topic of Novichok to Marsalek, remember, Marsalek not only waved about what he claimed was the formula to Novichok in an attempt to impress associates, he had procured what appeared to be a highly classified report about its use illegally from the BVT. But when Schmidbauer spoke of Novichok, he said Marsalek did not react at all. Still, nevertheless, Marsalek gave the impression that he did have deeper knowledge about it. Now, Schmidbauer, who knows former BVT agent Martin Weiss, well, he defended Weiss to the IC, saying when Weiss organized that private plane for Marsalek in June 2019, you know, when Marsalek paid cash to get to Minsk, Weiss didn't realize he was being used to help Marsalek escape justice. Weiss, former head of Special Unit BVT Intelligence, had a apparently missed all the headline news about Wirecard's implosion and just thought, hmm, Marsalek has asked for a late-night cash-only one-way flight to a Russian-friendly jurisdiction because he wanted to get some me-time in in Minsk? Weiss apparently called Schmidbauer later and said he didn't realize organizing the flight was for Marsalek's escape. Schmidbauer then called Weiss, quote, a useful idiot for Marsalek. Now, Marsalek was apparently known for using people, really, the guy who claimed he wanted to provide charity to Libya but then sought to build his own mercenary force in that country, disingenuous? Say it ain't so. But while Schmidbauer said he believes that Marsalek's relations with various intelligence agencies, eh, they were probably real, at least at some level, he rightly pointed out to the IC that every intelligent a service with any influence had a desire for access to a company like Wirecard. Why? Because, listeners, as you know, following the money is where it's at. And information about global payment flows is precisely what Wirecard possessed. To Schmidbauer, any intelligence agency that could use Marsalek obviously used this option. Uh, yeah, he told the IC that of course the German Federal Intelligence Service must have known about Marsalek and used him to their own advantage as well. Marsalek was enthusiastic. Well, that's one euphemism for an IT dork come James Bond fantasies do. Thought he was living in a Hollywood spy movie. And of course, other actors would have also exploited Marsalek's enthusiasm to their own advantage. After all, ultimately, intelligence really is just the collection, analysis, and exploitation of information. And not just intelligence officers use the hapless Marsalek, as you'll hear in a moment. Then came Fritsche to tell the IC his perspective on Marsalek and Wirecard's relationship with intelligence agency. He who lobbied for Wirecard. Of his lobbying, he said he thinks it, it's a very important and useful career option. Quote, if I can open the door, then I'll do it. <laughs> Fritschi the giver. Good for you, Klaus Dieter. Okay, Fritschi concurred that intelligence agencies from various countries had probably exploited Marsalek and used him to obtain access to financial information. Yes, because, like a hapless Labrador puppy, Marsalek kept hopping onto their laps and slobbering on them. But Fritsche told the IC that all of Marsalek's boasting of his alleged intelligence contacts struck him as being largely rubbish. Quote, people who are really involved with intelligence agencies don't talk about it. Conversely, those who talk about it are usually not really involved in that work. Quite. MP Damasi called Marsalek an intelligence freak and likened any intelligence agency scoring access to Wirecard's data as simply having hit the jackpot for any secret service. And then Fritschi told the IC that if Marsalek is indeed in Russia, God help him. As we all know, Russian intelligence demands a very concrete quid pro quo for every finger it lifts on someone's behalf. And since Marsalek is no longer capable of providing any useful information, after all, Wirecard has collapsed now. Well, he's kind of run out of playing cards to trade, hasn't he? 
Marsalek is now in a, hmm, well, let's call it a difficult situation. Or, as Fritchie put it, if he has survived his activities in the first place. <laughs> Couldn't have said it better myself. Fritchie's growing on me. And I'll add some data points to give listeners more to think about. Recall way back in July 2020 when Der Spiegel and Bellingcat tracked the history of Marsalek's visits to Russia? Marsalek began visiting back in 2004, and this is important, as you'll hear in a moment. He shopped for a potential Russian bank for wire card to purchase, moved about in the CIS, even held an Uzbekistan passport, one of many he possessed. Bellingcat had identified that whilst Marsalek's trips to Russia in 2015 and 16 were consistent and frequent, on September 15, 2017, something drastically changed. Bellingcat speculated, based on analysis of records, that Marsalek appeared to have been detained by the FSB. Now, remember last episode where I covered the Akhavan and Vegan prosecution in the U.S.? Well, more evidence keeps coming from that dynamic duo. FinCEN SAR filings obtained under FOIA request evidence Akhavan and Vigan and their entities receiving and sending wires to Canada, home of some of the related binary options and porn sites, the U.S., Austria, St. Kitts, where O'Sullivan and some related Russian entities had incorporated, the Philippines, the U.K., Cyprus, Latvia, Mark Solik and Burkhard Lay just love Latvia, Kurdakau, and more all of which tie back in one way or another to accounts held at Wirecard. Those FinCEN FOIA logs will also tell you who else is taking an interest in this case. Anywho, German, German news outlet Stern has been writing about the emails from Marsalek that they obtained from a former Wirecard colleague. From these, we have learned that Marsalek liked Trump, but he liked Putin better. Of all of Marsalek's dance, dance, dance dolls, Putin was his, quote, favorite. Agavan, according to Marsalek, wasn't just one of his BFFs, but wrote in an email that he thought of Agavan, whom he called Love, okay, as, quote, the most honest and honorable person I know. Hmm, well, honor among thieves, I suppose. Poor Agavan, languishing in U.S. federal prison, wondering where or where is his darling Yan Yan. Where, how did it all go so wrong? But we also learned from this trove of emails that a Russian partner company of Wirecard worked on a joint project with state-owned arms company Rostec, with Marsalek telling his colleagues, you have to report to Putin. Now hold on to Rostec and put it in your pocket for a moment. And we also learned that Marsalek, via Akovan, was introduced to both Gary Bernstein Bernson, sorry Gary, former CIA turned politician and Trump appointed ambassador to Germany, Richard Grenell. Now, when DOJ sought assistance from the Munich Public Prosecutor's Office, which resulted in the latter raiding Wirecard's office in December 2015, and too bad they didn't seize more back then, huh? Anyway, when the raid happened, Marsalek sought advice from Bernson. And from several sources, we now know that U.S. DOJ invited Marsalek to at least one meeting, possibly more, in late spring, early summer 2016. Now, playing both Austrian and German intelligence is one thing. After all, they cooperate with one another. But attempting to play two diametrically opposed countries' intelligence agencies, say Russia and the U.S., That's a whole different level and requires considerably more skill than the ability to wield a titanium card. When did the FSB first suspect Triple O Marsalek was potentially sharing what he knew about Russian-related money flows and accounts through Wirecard with U.S. intelligence? Exit pursued by a bear. Now, this whole connection to Marsalek and the German intelligence services prompted a question a few days ago from MP Fabio de Masi. You see, the IC had learned from disgraced former employee of Austria's BVT, Martin Weiss, or as Schmidbauer refers to him, our lovable idiot, that a company called Virtual Solutions AG, which provides certain services to German national security agencies, also has a link to Jan Marsalek. Specifically, Weiss had told the IC 
Virtual Solutions primary shareholder, Nicholas von Rintelen, was cozy with Marsalek and that Wirecard and Virtual Solutions may be engaged in, quote, business relations. The German government has confirmed Virtual Solutions and von Rintelen have a contract to handle the encryption of German classified data for electronic transmission. So Damasi asked the German government, have you examined this information from Weiss? Here is how the German federal government responded. Yeah, we don't actually have information on the statement that Weiss gave, re the close personal relationship between Marsalek and von Rintelen. Seriously, is there anyone Marsalek wasn't in a bromance with? But they added, the Federal Office for Information Security, BSI, has stated that there is no evidence of a close relationship between Rintelen and Marsalek and went on to say that, eh, an indeterminate proximity relationship without further security findings, eh, it doesn't really give them cause to examine this claim by Vice any further, or even question BSI's use of one of Virtual Solutions' products. Oh dear, this sure sounds like another German agency brushing off some information that probably warrants further scrutiny. Somebody in the BSI hasn't pay- been paying attention to how this whole thing with Wirecard got to where it did. But we here at the Wirecard saga are not so sanguine or dismissive of potentially relevant information. So unlike the German government's response to this question, as we're on the theme of Marsalek, Wirecard, intelligent agencies in Russia, let's just tug the thread that is Nicholas von Rintelen. German and Swiss listeners and chroniclers of the extended genealogy of the British royal family likely already know von Rentelen's name. Why? Well, his mother, Countess von Marenberg, is the last of the patrilineal line of the House of Nassau, which ties her to historic German, Luxembourg, and Russian royal houses. Oh, and Mummy Dearest also served as the chairwoman of the Hessian-Russian Intercultural uh, Exchange Organization. Nicholas, one of her children, this is von Rintelen, has been involved with a number of companies, mainly technology-related. For instance, Virtual Solution AG, the one Damasi was asking about related to Marsalek, of which von Rintelen is the primary shareholder, is a, quote, their press release, not my words, leading manufacturer of encryption solutions for mobile terminal devices. And they're based in Munich. Yeah, so likely no contact there. Tech, encryption, Munich, data transmission, wire card. <laughs> Wait. But the connections don't stop in this tenuous territory. Von Rintelen's various companies also include entities connected to a company called LifeCare, traded on the Norwegian stock exchange Merke Market. LifeCare teamed up with Swiss investment firm IMS Capital Partners to establish a joint venture to further develop LifeCare's technology. This joint venture was called Digital Diagnostics AG. Oh, ha! Major points for the handful of you listeners that spotted IMS Capital Partners. Yes, remember episode 11? Alexander Vuchok? Recall, Vuchok, partner to Marsalek, who didn't just run IMS Capital and now stands accused by German authorities of siphoning off millions via IMS to give to Marsalek just before he fled. Remember, IMS Capital Partners? was so cozy with Jan Marsalek that it maintained offices in Marsalek's villa in Munich. It was probably just down the hall from BVT's Martin Weiss, who is also said to have rented office space in Marsalek's villa. Uh, That's the one in Prince Regenstrasse. I love that Marsalek actually charged Weiss rent. The Boys' Secret Society Clubhouse. No girls allowed. Anyway, okay, back to Vuchok and von Rintelen. Remember, Vuchok is was also MD of, among other companies, Atraves, Comvel, Tui, Turbina Energy, hyped by BioNovate in Switzerland, and Henry O'Sullivan's Gumo. So now we have Vuchok as a second pivot point to Marsalek and O'Sullivan via von Rintelen. Full circle, full circle, ch- never mind. Vuchok's IMS teamed up with LifeCare to form digital diagnosis. Diagnostics, well, also known as JIGID. IMS, this is Vuchok helping funnel money for Marsalek, conferred its shares in Digid upon another Vuchok controlled company, Human Data AG. Now, this occurred in March 2020, as everything's imploding slowly. 
A few months later, in mid-October 2020, this is after Marsalakis fled, CEO of LifeCare, Joaquim Holter, was suddenly notified that Vuchok's Human Data AG had just traded an ownership stake in the company in a transaction in which Digid was, suddenly, valued at a whopping $868 million. The transaction in which no cash changed hands was met with some head-scratching at LifeCare. Why? Because Digid, this joint venture between IMS and LifeCare, to that point had produced zero revenue and hadn't made a single commercial product. So that valuation? Mm, a tad ambitious. Now, Norway's financial newspaper, Finisavision, pricked up its investigative reporting ears and called attention to both the rather aggressive valuation of Digid and the unusual transaction, observing that LifeCare's 25% stake in Digid was priced at 2 billion kroner, despite LifeCare having a stock market value of less than half a billion kroner. (laughs) That's some interesting math. All this attention caused a volt face, and Digid suddenly announced it had changed its mind, you know, the way companies do, and said it had canceled the transfer to Vuchok's Human Data AG. Now, Vuchok had been chairman of Digid until August 2020, before moving down to deputy chairman, whereupon he was arrested by German authorities. Halter of LifeCare had become a board member of Digid in that same summer of 2020. And the new chairman of Digid? None other than Nicholas von Rintelen, who through another one of his companies, VRV, now controls 20% of Digid after buying shares from Vuchok's human data earlier in the summer of 2020. Oh, and Digid received an agreed-upon 75 million kroner from IMS into its account. Now, let's also look at how Nicholas von Rintelen also ties back to Marsalik beyond just sharing companies with Vuchok and Mommy's German-Russian Cultural Exchange Club. Von Rintelen, can I just call him Nicky? Like to hit the Munich Security Conference, you know, the one Marsalik used to swan around. But more importantly, Nikki doesn't just own virtual solutions, provider of encryption to certain German intelligence agencies. Does, does that mean he provided the decryption key to his friend Marsalik? Oof, there's an uncomfortable question for BIS not to answer. Nikki, according to his speaker bio, submitted to the European Data Economy Conference for more than 10 years, has been, quote, a trusted advisor to the founder and CEO of Novatech, the second largest gas producer in Russia. In fact, Nikki claims he enabled Novatech to enter the EU market and develop the Swiss-based trading activities for it. Good for you, Herr von Rittelen. Bank compliance officers listening to this, You know Novatech. It's on the EU and U.S. OFAC sanctions lists. And of course, you know Novatech's non-executive director. It's none other than oligarch Gennady Timshenko. In fact, Timshenko's Volga Group is one of Novatech's largest shareholders. You know, Timshenko, well within the top five wealthiest businessmen in Russia who just happens to be one of Putin's closest allies. I hate to use the term friend because I've never been convinced Putin knows what genuine friendship really looks like. Nonetheless, Timshenko and Putin, well, they're really tight, so to speak. Timshenko is even thought to handle some of Putin's finances directly. And there's Nicholas von Rittelen helping a sanctioned company and oligarch tied to Russia's main man who just happens to have a connection to Vuchok, who himself is tied into Russia, and to Jan Marsalek, who was feeding information to Russian intelligence. I wonder if the FSB appreciated receiving the decryption keys to the software the German BSI was using for its encrypted classified data. (laughs) So, 
Let's turn to why Russia, and in particular, Russian organized crime and Russian intelligence, fit so centrally into the Wirecard saga. For this is a story of opportunism, both by Wirecard and those associated with it, and by Russia and entities within it. Why opportunism? As you'll hear, the many connections between Russia, and in particular its intelligence services and organized crime groups, and Wirecard, were not part of some great, carefully planned strategy. Rather, Wirecard's long-time services to those engaged in the less salubrious activities of the online world, porn, gambling, pot, fraud, so on and so forth, made it not only receptive to laundering for organized crime, but also to directing money flows to evade sanctions, fund autocrats, and genuinely generally, be put to use by Russian intelligence services in need of, well, obfuscating monies to pay for state-sponsored activities that further Russia's aim to disrupt the West, be it poisoning Russians abroad, hacking, or funneling money to separatist groups or disrupting elections. Wirecard was not discriminating with respect to its customers. In fact, the company's founding is rooted in crime. That is, Back in its very early formative years, it primarily earned income from obscuring and processing payments for the illicit. I've talked about this ad nauseum. Many executives of Wirecard in the early days, you know, the Nokelmans and the Troutmans at all, had made their first money from these online industries, learning along the way how to obscure from the eyes of law enforcement their companies and proceeds through layers of shell companies littered about the globe. Henry O'Sullivan had made his money this way, and from all accounts made quite a bit, from running online porn and gambling sites. But O'Sullivan's real skill lay in creating complex structures in loose jurisdictions that facilitated money laundering, sanctions busting, and tax evasion. And that drew in clients. And those clients, they needed banking. Now, criminals are no different from other business folks in this sense. Word gets out who the best service providers are. Wirecard essentially advertised its services to any and all that needed to obscure origins of funds. And that provided an opportunity to Russian organized crime and intelligence services. When it's advantageous, these two groups have been known to work together. Now, to set the stage, we need to get back into our time machine, back to the days of the Cold War. I know, some of you weren't, hadn't even been born yet. All right. Why are we going back? Because whilst there has been measurable growth of the criminalization of the Russian state under Putin, and that has led to the organized crime world typically operating below ground, so to speak, commingling with the political ruling class and oligarchs, above ground, if you will, and this amalgamation between the high and low, it's really not a new phenomenon. Even back in the days of the Tsars, Russian security services were known to seek out from organized crime sources information and even recruits. Loyalty is prized in both lines of work, as is a willingness to execute orders at whatever the cost. Officials such as those in the security services could also exploit for their own purposes and financial gain leverage over organized crime. The culture of Russian officialdom is really, and always has been, one of corruption. It is viewed as an opportunity for personal financial gain. Hold office or hold a government role? That's your cue to get a little, uh, get a little insider track. Offer to protect a certain OC group in return for a cut of their profits and a flow of information that can further your political ambitions or can be used for personal monetary gain? Okay. Nice criminal network you've got there. Shame if state had to shut down. Early stories in the Moscow Times and Russian news outlet Trud even documented way back that even Putin himself, as he rose up in the KGB, was known to engage in blackmail to secure loyalty and to further his career. Now, the relationship between the two sides, that is, organized crime and intelligence services, continued through the revolution, through the Stalin years, oh boy, through the Stalin years, and by the time the Soviet Union was collapsing. In fact, at that juncture, even Boris Yeltsin had to admit his country was, in his words, becoming a superpower of crime. Hey, at least you've stayed in the superpower category. As Russia privatized, and you know how all of those oligarchs made their fortunes, right? 
This fostered even closer ties to Russian OC because those networks had existing structures in place, from guns to money, to the means by which to siphon the proceeds of crime out of the country and into Western banks. And when I say proceeds of crime, well, pilfering from the state coffers and the state companies and, well, blackmail, extortion, and proceeds of corruption. Friends in low places. Now, the KGB had regularly availed itself of destabilization and subversion practices in furthering Soviet ambitions and strategy. That was long known. But with the breakup of the Soviet Union, multiple intelligence agencies were created. No longer was there just a single command structure from the top overseeing, well, military side GRU and KGB on the intelligence side. This new environment, in turn, led to a form of sort of competition between these groups and increased alliances or at least connections between the FSB, the GRU, the SVR, and other Russian intelligence agencies and Russian organized crime groups really took off. Now, several EU reports over the past few years have documented the ties between Russian organized crime and its state intelligence agencies. As well as espionage, Moscow's, hmm, call it special services, conduct active measures aimed at subverting and destabilizing European governments, operations in support of Russian economic interests, and attacks on political enemies. Now, conveniently, Russian OC already had networks in place in former Soviet states and across Europe. These networks have continued to provide both revenue, information, and pipelines for money in and out. For the likes of the GRU with its culture of risk-taking and military-based aggressiveness, they are, after all, home to the Spetsnaz, OC groups offer conduits to rebel groups in, well, Eastern Europe, and the means by which to traffic arms and engage in arms-length destabilization efforts. For instance, Reports from the EU documented that during the decade-long war in Chechnya in the early 2000s, Russia's security services, using organized crime connections, managed to get Chechen organized crime not to support the Chechen rebels. In other words, no weapons, no supply lines, no nothing. Lest Russian OC extract retribution. Okay, so Russian OC is ideal for the FSB to use for intelligence gathering, street activities in Western European countries, because that draws less attention, and for political influence, like voter intimidation and meddling in elections. Remember, tradecraft of organized crime is political corruption. Opportunity knocks. No longer managed centrally, FSB, GRU, and other Russian intelligence agencies have become a bit more like Russian OC groups they consort with. That is, they're more entrepreneurial. Competing to obtain intelligence useful to Putin and the Kremlin has seen these agencies engage in greater and greater, actually more and more aggressive tactics, but also to demonstrate what we might call out-of-the-box thinking or hubris. In other words, no deed too extreme. Now, the beauty of Russian OC and their connections around greater Europe is they provide the cover and the cash to Russian intelligence. Who dominates Illegal gambling? Organized crime. Who dominates the porn industry, particularly hardcore and porn featuring children? OC. Who runs elaborate hacking and online fraud uh, card uh, networks around the globe? OC. Who cheerfully assassinates business rivals or those proving to be obstacles to smooth operations? OC. What's not for the FSB and GRU to love and take advantage of? And all the money that flows from these activities? Well, someone has to play banker. Wirecard saw an opportunity. After all, they were already processing for many of these groups and industries. Russian intelligence? They spotted an opportunity in Wirecard. Try to see it their way. Western financial institution with zero scruples, and I mean zero, who actually advertise their ability to conceal the origins of transactions. One willing to not just launder, but to use its executives' collective knowledge on constructing complex offshore structures by which to move seriously big money. Billions. 
Russian intelligence officers could happily exploit both legal and illegal economic opportunities presented by the connections to these individuals and companies current and former Wirecard executives could introduce them to. And then there was Marsalik, happy to be used if it meant he got to pretend he was a spy or a warlord or whatever the fantasy of the day was. As the bell quoted an associate of Marsalik saying, I don't know any dudes more cynical than him. Ugh, talk about opportunity. One thing we have to give Wirecard's dirty execs is that they were at the forefront of recognizing the opportunities, the early unregulated landscape of virtual assets, cryptocurrencies, card not present payment processing, and online banking represented. Wirecard had already opened a virtual bank in Second Life back in 2007. Only a handful of us back then were looking at the risks of money laundering taking place in MMORPGs at that juncture. Wirecard was way ahead of the pack. It would identify gaps and then just exploit the hell out of them. Why should the FSB and GRU try to invent new mechanisms when Wirecard was doing it for them? And Wirecard was flush with information on individuals and people from around the world, including information from other intelligence agencies, such as German and Austrian. And this information, one could bank it, exploit it, manipulate it. Russia already melds power, money, and crime together. Russian OC has a long history of being used as an instrument of Russian state power. And OC has nothing to fear so long as they don't challenge Russian intelligence agencies. Instead, go into business with them. Politics and corruption now blend, well, pretty seamlessly with the illicit. And this blurring of lines is intentional and benefits greatly those in the corridors of the Kremlin or who orbit Putin, including many of the oligarchs. And in return, organized crime can invest the dirty money, launder the proceeds, repatriate it for the benefit of those in power. There is a reason we saw an uptick in wirecard activities in 2014. Western sanctions bit Russia and its oligarchs, and it bit them hard. The sanctions regime targeting Russia and Russian oligarchs and those tied to dirty deeds has only continued to expand since, those, since then. This has driven an urgent need to construct new structures by which to evade sanctions, law to the proceeds of corruption, those crony oligarchs have needs, protect what few industries Russia has, that has kept the Russian economy afloat, gas, oil, and keep Russia's self-designated accountable to no one CEO Putin perched precariously at the top. Russian OC, not confined to Russian borders, you can find them around the globe, are not small-time players. They hold major investments in certain sectors and maintain alliances far afield. However, one thing they have in common with Russia's security apparatus is ultimately loyalty to the motherland. No matter where they're based or even what country's passport they're holding, they are tied to Russia. And collectively, both appear to hold a deep belief that the West is, well, out to get Russia, that somehow, I don't know, there's like a deep existential threat to the country which requires extreme actions, even when it means they will incur international opprobrium. Biden just unfriended me. Doesn't matter. What does matter is how useful one is to the motherland. And both the Soloviki and Russian OC, once in, once made, well, Let's just say there's no such thing as a former member of either. So, these criminal activities and their Chernaya Casa, dark money accounts, are useful tools. A little crime pays some profits. Profit sharing amongst friends like the FSB. And then suddenly, there is money for operations with no direct connection back to Moscow. Helpful when funding dirty regimes such as Assad's in Syria or underwriting a sophisticated bribery scheme in the Ukraine designed to help subsidize Russia's war and occupation in that country using zombie intermediaries. <clears throat> Semyon Moglovich, Dmitry Furtash, sanctions busting, and so on. You get the idea. And who is banking a lot of that black money? Say it with me. Wirecard. The more Russian operations revolve around active measures, the more they involve money that has to be spent or even donated. 
And because really current laws and regulations in the EU are still not sufficiently robust to address the volume of dirty money pouring through its banks, not just Russian, kleptocrats, autocrats, gangsters, tax evaders, all included, the Kremlin has a lot of interchangeable tools in its toolbox. So back to opportunity. Use the tool, be it an individual or a structure, that will be most useful to the state at that moment. Laws, schmaws, criminal spies and agents as instruments, whether controlling political prisoners in the gulags or compromising foreigners, are to be used as needed. And speaking of compromising foreigners, let's just take a quick gallop through some of the highlights of the Wirecard clients with a nexus to Russian state security agencies and or Russian organized crime. So German news outlet, the Star and uh, Capital, got hold of emails and other Wirecard documents from former employees. Well, not surprising. Some of them show Armar Solik, in particular, had been in contact with businessmen from Russia and the Ukraine for years, but not just Marsalik, and that he knew some of them were linked to organized crime. I told you, opportunity. Wirecard welcomed the business. I told you back in episode 18 all about Marsalik pressuring Wirecard Bank to open dozens of accounts for the companies of Putin-affiliated Ukrainian oligarch Dmitryo Fertash. For years, the U.S. has been pursuing Fertash's extradition in Austrian courts on the grounds of, well, suspicion of bribery, membership in criminal organization, and Austrian courts continue to drag their feet. In addition, Spain has issued a European arrest warrant for Fertash on suspicion of money laundering through real estate transactions and restaurants worth some $10 million. You can find a rich source of stories about Fertash and his corrupt Russian-Ukrainian grass trade scheme as well. Now, recall, Fertash lives in the Austrian capital, Vienna. He made his money thanks to, well, controversial gas deals with the Russian state-owned company Gazprom. And he's now active in the business of pipelines, natural gas, other raw materials, and, I don't know, he controls some eight television stations in the Ukraine by now. So pause for a moment on him living in Vienna. Remember Alexander Schutz, now former chairman of Deutsche Bank and holiday buddies with Wirecard former CEO Marcus Braun? He was asked to resign from Deutsche, is now facing a criminal probe related to his Wirecard share trading activities. As it happens, Schutz's buddy, Braun, lives on the same street as Furtosh in the Hitzing district. Now, there's nothing that directly connects Braun and Furtosh. It was Marsalik, after all, setting up Furtosh's accounts at Wirecard. But get this, Furtosh rents his luxury accommodation from none other than one of Schutz's companies. That's right, Furtosh is one of Schutz's tenants. See what I mean about opportunity? And Furtosh, while batting his eyes and proclaiming innocence, has been deeply tied to Russian organized crime boss Semyon Mogilevich. But rather unfortunately for his tale of incorruptibility, A few years back, WikiLeaks leaked a cable from the American ambassador to Russia, well, the then American ambassador to Russia, that recounted Furtosh admitting Moglevich was the real power behind his, Furtosh's, multi-billion dollar gas interests in the Ukraine, telling then ambassador Bill Taylor it was impossible to conduct business in the Ukraine in the 90s without, well, striking some dodgy deals with organized crime. Furtash has also struggled to bat away evidence that Moglovich held covert interests in the Swiss incorporated Rue, RUE, which distributes gas from Central Asia. See, Furtash nominally owns or owned nearly half of Rue. U.S. prosecutors have described Furtash as being, to quote, upper echelon associate of Russian OC. Moglovich, he's still on the FBI's 10 most wanted list. Now, those emails from Marsalik and others at Wirecard have surfaced 
given how many employees were made redundant, it isn't surprising we're now enjoying such a treasure trove of electronic communications from the company. The emails show poor hapless AML officer at Wirecard Bank, Marcus Kolpaintner, remember him, voicing concerns about Furtosh's alleged relationship with Moglovich, only to have Marsalik tell him that 10 plus accounts it was opening for Furtosh and his gas company was a quote, misunderstanding that these accounts were really for Furtosh's benefit. The emails go on with supposedly Alexander von Noop and Marsalik holding lengthy, saying, uh, the emails say supposedly, uh, and this is supposedly von Noop and Marsalik having held lengthy phone conversations with Furtosh's people, my people. And then account after account being opened for Furtosh, even though they know they're not really for Furtosh. The Furtosh group was, quote, an A-plus customer and a Jan Marsalek customer. A bank employee wrote to the in-house money laundering department at the end of March 2020. And at that time, another company from the Furtosh collection, SCI LM Holdings, which owns a villa, La Moresque, an estate in saint jean cap east of Nice, also got opened accounts. Now, Furtosh and his various entity accounts were suspected of money laundering by Wirecard compliance folks at that time. And even back in July of 2019, July 11th, an anonymous whistleblower had contacted Boffin, pointing out that a Furtosh company was doing, quote, large transactions abroad every day at Wirecard Bank. A day later, sadly, Boffin's money laundering department classified this tip from the whistleblower as, quote, not relevant under regulatory law, and that the notice contained no usable information. Seriously? Oh, man. Boffin. Understand, Furtosh has a network of at least 200 companies and sub-companies incorporated in all the best havens. Other cables released by WikiLeaks connected Furtosh and Mogolovich, linking them closely through numerous offshore vehicles. Oh, and sharing a lawyer. Zev Gordon, no relation. The story of Furtosh and Mogolovich, YBM Magnex, it could be its own episode. So, so the Mogolovich organization maintains a full portfolio. In addition to murder, prostitution, money laundering, gems dealing, it traffics in weapons, it dabbles in nuclear materials, and like so many multinationals, it has branches in Prague, Vienna, Moscow, Israel, France, Slovakia, and Mogilevich. He'd been arrested in Russia back in 2008, but rather mysteriously, or not, was released less than a year later, and has largely been operating with impu- there in Russia with impunity ever since. Russia does just find through him and his right-hand Furtash. Opportunity, baby. Of course, you all remember Bulgarian Christo Georgiev, right? Identified by Europol as being heavily tied to Bulgarian organized crime. Now, Russian business connections in Russia are full one quarter of the entire GDP of that country. And recall Georgiev, client of Wirecard and partner with several former Wirecard execs, and of course, owner of Cyprus based Sada Bank that was shut down for money laundering for Russian organized crime, hundreds of other criminal enterprises. And you remember Georgiev's business partner, Ruben Vigand, right? He convicted in the US. Now, in episode 7 and 13, I told you also about FBME Bank and its relationship of accounts with Wirecard, and how FBME also excelled at concealing transaction origins, how it shared an executive with Wirecard and tied back to others connected to the card. And you hear, you heard that FBME provided a network of secret slush funds for use by Russia to fund Syria's chemical weapons program and terrorist group ISIS. The joint accounts between FBME and Wirecard were used to launder some of the money stolen by Russian officials. Think Armitage Capital, the thefts that led ultimately, ultimately, years later, to the Magnitsky Act. FBME and Wirecard, much of the cash became the means by which to run in excess of $30 million to Syria to fund Assad's chemical weapons program, weapons he purchased from Russia. And recall back in 2017... Marsalek had boasted, and these are from texts, 
text messages of having traveled out to Palmyra, or what's left of it, in Syria, as a guest of the Russian military shortly after its recapture from ISIS. But it wasn't official Russian forces that had cleared Palmyra. It was a mercenary group. So let's talk about the Wagner Group. This is a group of mercenaries controlled by Eugenie Prigozhin. The Wagner Group, a private military allegedly cooked up by Prigozhin back in 2010 at an economics conference of all things, but then that is what ultimately drives conflict, right? Money and control? Okay. Where did Prigozhin come from? Well, in the 80s, he spent time in prison for crimes including fraud, robbery, and encouraging minors to engage in criminal activities, a mentor of sorts. And then in the 1990s, he opened a chain of hot dog stands. I'm not kidding. But from that, he built up a presence in the restaurant industry and caught Putin's eye. Who says you can't be a self-made man in modern Russia? Putin trusts him. And that's why the Wagner Group is the preferred vehicle the Kremlin uses to recruit, train, and deploy mercenaries, either to fight wars or to provide security and training to friendly regimes. And despite being built to serve the needs of Putin's regime, it's not even a legally registered company in Russia. Plausible deniability. Opportunity. The Wagner Group was first tested by the Kremlin in the Ukraine. What better way to fight a covert war? Use mercenaries. The Kremlin can deny responsibility for Wagner by keeping it outside state control. In fact, in an interview a number of years ago, Putin himself said Russia bears no responsibility whatsoever for whatever Prigozhin and Wagner get up to. Wagner has been used in Chad, it's been used in Venezuela, and for running Wagner, Prigozhin is rewarded, rewarded by Putin with highly lucrative defense contracts worth hundreds of millions of dollars. And if the theater of operation happens to have valuable natural resources, Prigozhin is allowed to profit from them. Now, in 2015, Wagner was deployed to Syria. By 2016, Assad's regime was paying a Wagner front company for military services to essentially prop him up. In return, Brugoshin's company receives one quarter of the profits from oil and gas fields it seizes on behalf of the Assad regime. Now, Wagner played a pivotal role in capturing and then recapturing Palmyra and Dirazar in 2016 and 2017. That's when Marsalik seemingly went out to visit and see the sites of Palmyra. Whilst there, there has been some squabbling around tactics in Syria between GRU and Wagner. It's not always gone well for Wagner, that's a different story. Nonetheless, Wagner is still a presence in Syria. As of 2019, it was using buildings designated as being part of a children's vacation camp, because nothing says holiday like an active war zone owned by yet another one of Prigozhin's companies called Megalane. Now, Wagner continues to defend oil and gas assets. After all, Prigozhin doesn't want to lose control of his prizes, and Wagner mercenaries fight and torture alongside Assad's troops. In fact, there's a lawsuit against Wagner that's worth a, really worth a read. Did I mention there's a reward for Prigozhin being offered by the FBI? Or that Prigozhin is also on the U.S. sanctions blacklist. Of course, so are Assad and his entire regime, just like so many Russians. And that is where the business relationship between Marsalik and Prigozhin came in handy. Because Marsalik and Wirecard could get money in and out of Syria and wars, including those that use chemical weapons against their citizens, are costly, as in control of oil and gas fields, or offer regional power. Call it Russia's opportunistic brand of foreign policy. Now, nearby was another country on Russia's influencer list, Libya. Remember back in episode 7, and go back if you've forgotten, where I gave you the rundown on Marsalik in that country? First, he was going to engage in charitable good works there, then he switched tack and decided to run his own mercenary force. He owned cement companies out there, Libyan Cement Company, LLC. Uh, sold by an Austrian conglomerate in 2015 to Libya Holdings Group. LLC hires Russian company uh, Rosiski System Bezobaznosti, RSB Group, to engage in what they euphemistically called demining operations in Libya. Only where they were performing activities just happened to be in the part of Libya held by the warlord, 
warlord Khalifa Haftar, he who was supported by Russia. RSB likes to use FSB and Spatsnaz forces in all of its corporate activities. See how this all comes together? Now, recall this venture of Marsalek's drew in Austrian Brigadier Gustav Gustenau, one of Austria's most senior security experts in the Ministry of Defense. Russia, via the real brains behind the operations in Libya, Andrei Shuprierin, former GRU, part of Putin's inner circle, purportedly pulled puppet Marsalek string as they wanted a different Russian private security group in there running mercenary forces of their own choosing, not Marsalek's pop-up uh, group. But they still plan to disguise the money moving to and from these operations through Wirecard. And according to documents, Mark Salek made a strong case for a particular company active in Libya, sending emails about the company's failure to make interest payments on loans Wirecard had made to it. Oh, good grief. Now, Marsalek, recognizing those pesky sanctions, attributed the non-payment as possibly coming down to, quote, the very restrictive handling of foreign payments by the Libyan Central Bank. Already on a list of Wirecard bank bad debts in September 2019, the loan of $3 million was listed as defaulted after a delay of 458 days, that is, as a default, as, as well as being tied back to a Luxembourg company of the two Russians. Now, RSB Group has been identified as having engaged in a number of transactions via Wirecard that were designed to conceal their true nature. And the Libyan cement company and Benghazi that had employed fighters from RSB in 2016 and 2017? Conveniently, Wirecard then brought in a company called RSB Holdings Limited in Dubai. Its parent, RSB Global, based in Moscow, offers a suspiciously similar performance profile to the RSB Group. Hmm... In December 2017, RSB in Dubai ordered a software license, sure, from Wirecard for 1.6 million euros, ostensibly for a platform for prepaid cards. Even Auditor EY supposedly requested the financial statements of RSB in March 2019 because they thought it looked a little odd. God, at least they got something right. Now, emails exclusively available to German media outlet Focus, show that Chupiran controlled Project Libya from the very beginning, right? This is our GRU man. In January 2018, he hosted a dinner party in Munich. He invited Gustenau and Germany's former ambassador to the UN, who was there to somehow help the effort. Gustenau wrote an email to Chupiran about logistics and said, quote, we would have to discuss tomorrow with Jan. Jan Marsalek, of course. So here is a high-ranking Austrian military officer involved in an obscure foreign policy project, but one that just happens to have direct contact with a Russian intelligence officer. And the Austrian Ministry of Defense in Vienna has confirmed that it knew Marsalek was playing a role on the fringes of this Libyan project. In fact, according to one intelligence official who told a focus, the news outlet, quote, Marsalek and his Russian contacts were never about refugees. It was always about oil. And it turns out this has been borne out by Marsalek, documentation that's now surfaced, showing that Marsalek contacted the head of Austrian oil company, OMV. Rainer Seal, who leads OMV, now denies speaking to Marsalek, but chat logs kind of show otherwise. How did Marsalek get to Seal? Well, via middlemen from the ruling FPO party in Austria and the Austrian French Russian Friendship Society, Natch. Seal also happens to be president of the German Russian Chamber of Commerce. God, this is tidy. A few years ago, Putin even awarded him the Order of Friendship. And OMV and Gazprom? They have significant business leaks links. In fact, in Libya, OMV produces about 7% of its oil. Oh, In March 2019, the OMV announced that it would invest in sustainable development in Libya. 
and beyond the connection to RSV and RSB and OMV, intelligence now believes Russia just like that it could use Wirecard as its financial services provider. Now, other Wirecard internal emails and other documents evidence Marsalik and others at Wirecard had for years been in contact with businessmen from Russia and Ukraine. A fair number of them, again, tied to organized crime. Opportunity, remember? For example, Marsalik in 2015 helped an individual identified as Shamil I, sure, a small-time thug and frontman for Putin-loyal governor of the Russian region Ulon, um, uh, laundering money through Wirecard. Shamil shared a company registered in St. Vincent and the Grenadines with Leonoid A, an individual said to have a past history of looting ATMs. Okay, well, Leonoid was also on a sanctions blacklist due to his known involvement in financial crime, so maybe a little bit bigger than ATMs, huh? Anyway, together, through two companies in the islands, they founded Aviatech in Luxembourg in 2015, which in turn had a subsidiary in Russia called Skytech as their subsidiary. Now, it was supposed to provide payment services to Russian airlines. Oh, sure it was. How did Marsalik spin wirecard banking these two along with their Luxembourg Russian Caribbean startup? He wrote to colleagues in the bank that, quote, Aviatech Holding is a Luxembourg based group of companies that, through its subsidiary in Russia, Skytech Russia, is the tender for the technical handling of all, really all, Russian airline transactions. Skytech will use Wirecard technology. Of course it will. Aviatech, brand new company with no credit or operational history, was granted by Wirecard Bank a credit line of 6 million euro. But wait for it. That 6 million dollar, uh, 6 million euro line of credit, it was guaranteed by Wirecard AG, the parent company. By the end of 2019, it was already clear that millions had gone, and with them, Shamil and Leonoid. Various attempts to contact had failed, according to a bank manager. In fact, the bank manager told the KPMG auditors in January 2020, yeah, not certain where these people went or the money. Moreover, the shareholding in the Russian company Skytech was, quote, sold to a third party without the bank's knowledge. Well, Marsalik knew about the sale. The company, he said, was now managed by another Russian, Felix, <coughs> who had quietly taken over in 2019 and who cheerfully told Marsalik that his daughter, Felix's, had taken the company over as well. So, of course, the check's in the mail for that loan repayment. But that didn't stop Marsalik from providing Felix's company with a further loan of 2.5 million euros. And it, too, seemed to lack for, well, repayment. So Marcos Salik communicated with Felix, now that all these loans are due, about exploring the possibilities of a greater digitalization of public transport in the Uzbek capital Tashkent in Central Asia. Yeah, in Tashkent, of all places. And lo and behold, internal wirecard emails suggested that Henry O'Sullivan was tied in to the Luxembourg company belonging to Leonid and Shamil. You know, of Aviatech, parent company that had already cost Wirecard some six million in unpaid loans. And what happened to Skytech? <coughs> Excuse me, the other, <laughs> the other startup? Skytech sought to sign a cooperation agreement with a subsidiary of none other than Russian arms company Rostec. I told you to keep it in your pocket. Yes, at an aviation salon in Moscow in August 2015, Skytech tried to hook up with Rostec and invited Wirecard to join it. A few years on, EY would actually wake up long enough to write in one of its reports that Rostec, since 2014 has been under EUS and EU sanctions for its involvement in the annexation of Crimea in the Ukraine. 
you detecting the theme here? According to confidential documents of the German security authorities, and, and in this case, Stern and Capital got hold of these, German security authorities, Germany's attorney general was investigating the suspicion that Marsalik had, quote, engaged in possible intelligence for Russian intelligence services in this summer of 2020. Yeah, well, you're a little late there. The source of the suspicion, and for a number of files from apparently Russian authorities that they'd managed to get their hands on, was a witness known only as G, who'd already testified in the trial of the Tiergarten murder. And you can go look up Tiergarten. And that's a contract hit that was done on, on a Georgian by, at the Russian state uh, request back in 2019 in Berlin. And there's some evidence that this G, who's a journalist, had researched both the perpetrator of the Tiergarten case, the killer there, and the flight that Marsalik took to Minsk in Belarus. The list goes on. To Kaka, um, Deripaska, additional Russian connections via Akhavan, Vigan, Shoot, Georgiev, to Kakutov. This episode could go for hours and still not touch all of it. <clears throat> Documents show that at least some of Wirecard staff, beyond just Marsalik, know they were in business of laundering for gangsters, the state and the organized kind. When Mauritius was selected for incorporation of one entity, one Wirecard employee wrote that Mauritius has been chosen in order to make it more difficult to identify the beneficial owner. <laughs> now, Russian magazine uh, Versa, uh, Versa had stated that they thought Marsalik is more important to the Kremlin than Edward Snowden. I disagree with that assessment. He and Wirecard were just tools to be used. European countries and other Western jurisdictions have yet to truly and effectively build a capacity to combat money laundering or identify the UBOs of corporate structures. All this risk-based AML emphasis creates, well, opportunities for laundering by gangsters of all ilk because it hopes for skill, knowledge, and most importantly, inclination to identify and stop it. Wirecard wasn't so inclined. Opportunity created. Win-win for Wirecard and Russia. There's a Russian quote that in my very poor translation comes out as, if the West loses, we gain. As far back as 2010, the British MI5 was warning that the threat from Russian espionage continues to be significant and is similar to the Cold War. The number of Russian intelligence officers in London alone is at the same level as the Soviet times. Since then, security services across Europe have been registering a continued uptick in the scale and aggressiveness of Russian operations. So Wirecard and Marsalik, evidence of opportunity seized in the new Cold War. On the positive, despite the increasingly frosty relationship between Russia and much of the West, Austria aside, we're probably not going to return to the days of reforger. So, woohoo, silver linings and all that. And that is it for this week's episode. Listeners, you know the lyrics to Gangster's Paradise. Power in the money, money in the power. Follow the money to find out who holds the power in this one. Keep sipping your gin and juice, and I'll see you next week. We're going to tackle gambling. Okay, I'm Mikhail Ryder-Gordon. This is the Wirecard Saga. My thanks, as always, to the amazing Tom Fox and the award-winning Compliance Podcast Network. I'll see you next time. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox. I'd like to thank you for listening to this episode of The Wirecard Saga. The Wirecard Saga is a special production of the Compliance Podcast Network and a proud member of C-Suite Radio. Thanks so much for listening, and we look forward to visiting with you again in the new year.